any violence by a large population is, is not because this people is more violent than any other. It's an alarm, it's a sign, it's a, it's a signal that something is wrong in the treatment of this population. shows the scene in Jerusalem as Jewish and Arab mobs clashed in the center of the city. It remains to be seen whether a threatened full-scale war will materialize. جلود يعتلون المنازل والقناص لا يتورعون عن إطلاق النار على كل شيء يمر أمامهم بمن فيهم الصحفيين. As a journalist, the more you look into the issue of Israel and Palestine, the more you sense that something is not quite right. The images and the narration are out of sync, a little like a foreign film that has been awkwardly dubbed. As you look into it for yourself, you begin to suspect that there is something extremely odd going on. The more you look into it, the more you begin to feel it is not just odd, it is deeply disturbing. Our media portray Mideast violence 
as though it's an inherent part of the culture and region, implying that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is an ancient problem with little hope of solution. دمار يخلفه الجيش الإسرائيلي في كل شبر من الضفة الغربية مدينة السلام المحاصرة لا زالت ترفع غصن الزيتون وكنيسة المهد تقصف بالآليات العسكرية مئتا مواطن محاصرون داخل الكنيسة دون طعام أو دواء These misperceptions come from the fact that we're only hearing a fraction of the story You are about to witness images and testimony largely hidden from mainstream America. This place draws many people, whether they're Jewish, Muslim, or Christian. This is a holy place to significant numbers of us in the world. We all have an interest in sort of seeing what is this land and what's the situation here. And once you come, it, if you open your eyes at all, you can't miss the problems and the patterns that are here. I think it's hard to, to understand what occupation is. I think it's a foreign concept for many Americans, what it's like to live under military occupation. The definition of an occupation is when a foreign army occupies your land physically and controls your life. In addition, Palestinians under occupation, and this is why there's so much struggle against the occupation, they're not citizens, they don't have rights, they don't have civil rights, they're under a military rule. This is a particular kind of occupation that's both military and settler occupation. Settlements are areas of Palestinian land which are selected and whatever is there, whether it's roads or whether it's villages or homes, they are bulldozed and then a new town is built on the hilltop. One very good friend is uh, Rod Rodina Jabber and she and her husband Opta have land in a rural valley near here called the Ba'a. And it's pretty clear these settlements want this land. It's some of the best agricultural land around here. So that valley has had repeated home demolitions. Rodina herself has lived through two home demolitions. They're living now in their third house. <laughs> <laughs> Rodina and her children were once again homeless and had to endure living in a tent for many months. Her husband Atta was even imprisoned for protesting the destruction of their home. Yama, 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 Shufi, Min, Yama, Shufi, Jesh. I built a little team, Ajana Jesh. 
هذا تصوت من شقه وهذا يسرخ من شقه وهذا حاملته والجيش بقول هات هويتك هات الهويه ومن دون ضوء بقول لهم يوم ما بكرهوش وبسكت فيهم بمسكهم بعطلهم انا بكون خايفه اكثر منهم بس شو بدنا نسوي؟ Here you have Palestinians that have no input whatsoever in the policies that are made. They're not on the city council. They're not in any of the decision-making bodies in the West Bank or Gaza. They're certainly not on the government. The policies are made in order to ensure Israeli control. So the law is, is designed in a way, in a very cynical way, to um, prevent Palestinians from building and to keep them confined in little islands so that most of the land of the, of the occupied territories is free for Israeli settlement. These are uh, armed settlements, about 190 of them spread all over the West Bank. Settlements are strategically built colonies of Israel that are connected by a network of roads which separate each Palestinian community from the next and confine their ability to expand. They are often constructed around the best farmland and water resources. They are surrounded by barbed wire. They are armed inside. Settler residents are required to be armed by the Israeli military. And they are defended from the outside by the Israeli military itself. The purpose of these settlements today, number one, is to continue the Israeli control and domination of the occupied territories. And the bottom line in all of this is to make Palestinians leave the country. It's a very hard term, I know, but in a sense it's a kind of ethnic cleansing. The Israeli government and the Israeli army is not dealing with uh, people as equal. I mean, I, th I think that that's the main problem, that Palestinians are not considered, are not perceived as equals to Israelis. There is no specific discrimination against Palestinian Christians as opposed to Palestinian Muslims. It's a shared suffering. Christians see them very much selves, very much a part of, of the Palestinian national movement. They identify with the Palestinian people as, as being their people. Palestinian Christians have difficulty uh, getting to churches on Sunday morning if they wanted to come to Jerusalem because they don't have that permission or that legal right, according to the Israeli government, to come to Jerusalem for worship. This I picked up in a home of a wonderful Christian family in Beit Jala. And this is the kind of armor-piercing weaponry that's being used against civilians, innocent civilians. some words, but you can't tell how they feel. As everybody, I want my children to be happy, to live their right life as children. We just think about one thing. Where can I put my children while they are shooting? They didn't want to go to school because they are scared to come back and there is no house. They doesn't want to go home without me and the father because they think that they will lose us. What about these children? Why they are going to the streets? They don't think, let's go to swim, because I'm sure they, they have no right to swim now. Why? Because we are Palestinian. Thanks, God. I don't imagine that there is a woman in all of the world
can send their child or her man just go to die. They think we are working all of this life to give them something and to let them die in a minute? Can you? The suffering, the persecution of Christians, they've been robbed of their heritage. They've been robbed of their ancestral lands. They've been robbed of their culture. Some of the first converts to the teachings of Jesus were Palestinians. So that's how long Christians have been in uh, that land. Their quarter, the Christian quarter, has been really, really decimated and taken over and sliced up. That has really uh, bled the Christian community to where they're less than 2% of the population now. The presence of a Christian community within uh, the Holy Land, can you imagine where, where Jesus first stepped foot will no longer be there. I know both from the moral sense and from the practical sense that the only way to, to stop the violence is to treat the, the root cause from which the violence has started. The number one myth that, that Westerners have about this conflict is that Arabs and Jews have been fighting for thousands of years and they're going to continue to fight. This is really quite bizarre because all it takes is a little bit of reading of history to find out that this just isn't true. There is no congenital historical enmity between the Arabs and the Jews. The Jews flourished in the Arab world at a time when they were being persecuted throughout all of Europe. At the end of the 19th century, because of anti-Semitism in Europe, European Jews began to try and figure out a solution to the Jewish problem. A very small minority adhered to Zionism, the idea that the only place in which they could be safe is within the Jewish state. Zionist Jews um, actually had a, a design on uh, the land of Palestine, the idea of creating a homeland for Jews in the land of Palestine. And this uh, is really the beginning of the conflict. The mainstream Israeli Jewish society believed, because that's the way they had been educated, that Palestine was empty, had been empty when the Jewish settlers came there. Who paid the price when they settled there? Is it really true that Israel was a land without a people for a people without a land? Palestine was not empty. It was a land populated by Arabs who had a high level of culture, high level of education with farms and markets and towns and villages and roads and commerce and lots of interaction with the rest of the world. The population was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly Arab. Jewish immigration increased under British rule following World War I when Britain implemented the Balfour Declaration, promising a Jewish homeland in Palestine. This measure conflicted with Britain's previous promise of self-rule for Arab inhabitants throughout the region. Britain was basically extremely supportive of the Zionist movement. It helped to establish all of the structures of a state. At the same time, the Arabs of Palestine were denied the right of self-determination. The Palestinians saw a European power decide the future of a non-European territory in flat disregard of both their presence and wishes. In the 1920s, as land was being stripped away from local residents, the first clashes between Palestinians and Jews began and would continue on for years to come.
Until the early 1930s, the Jewish population of Palestine remained under 17%. Hitler's rise to power in Germany completely changed that. In just five years, 174,000 Jews flooded into Palestine, doubling their population. As the world attempted to make amends for the horrors of Nazi genocidal policies, Efforts to make Palestine a Jewish homeland increased. The Palestinians, they were not the Nazis. They were not responsible for the Holocaust. But they were the ones who paid the price. In 1947, with the conflict spiraling out of control, Britain decided to turn the problem of Palestine over to the United Nations. The UN, under pressure, proposed to divide the land into two states an Arab state and a Jewish state. Arabs were to be given 43% of the land, despite the fact that they made up more than two-thirds of the population and owned over 92% of the land. Jews were to be given 56%, although they comprised only one-third of the population and owned less than 8% of the total area. Nevertheless, they were given not only most of the land, they were given the most fertile land. Zionist leaders took advantage of their superior military preparation and immediately began occupying major Arab cities in Palestine. I was among the people that conquered Akko. When we were walking around, we entered the flat. There was a pair of shoes of a small child, maybe two years old. They didn't have time to put on the shoes, so they left the shoes and they ran away. They left everything. We found out that there was a systematic expulsion of Palestinians, and there was, as I said, there was an ethnic cleansing operation taking place. The most infamous campaign was the massacre at the village of Deir Yassin, where over 100 men, women, and children were systematically murdered. the ruthlessness of the attack on Deir Yassin drove fear and panic into the Palestinian population and led to the flight of unarmed civilians from their homes all over the country. As a result, maybe 300 or so thousand Palestinians had already been expelled before the first Arab soldier entered Palestine. Some of the neighboring Arab armies finally intervened after May 15, 1948, when Israel officially announced its statehood. Although there was a lot of war rhetoric on the Arab side, very few soldiers, Arab soldiers, were sent into the battlefield. And actually, for most parts of the war, there was a superiority uh, on the side of the Israeli uh, army. The Israeli army cleansed much of the territory and took over a large part of the designated Palestinian state. 
The new state of Israel encompassed 78% of the total land of Palestine. The West Bank came under Jordanian control and the Gaza Strip under Egyptian dominion. Although a truce was declared between Israel and the Arab states, true peace remained elusive as over 700,000 Palestinian refugees languished in nearby camps, often in sight of homes to which they still held the deeds and a deep desire to return. Most of the deserted and evicted Palestinian uh, villages were erased from upon the earth and were either turned into Jewish settlements or into a fertile uh, land. Of the 500 Palestinian villages in what became in Israel in 1948, 400 were destroyed. These efforts to destroy the possibility of their returning home were countered by the United Nations, which continues to affirm their human right enshrined in international law and morality to return. A Palestinian who had lost her land or lost his land uh, as the result of the, the creation of Israel in 1948 cannot come back even for a visit. I can go back to Israel as if I were returning and claim immediate citizenship, having no historic tie, speaking no Hebrew, knowing no one in the country, having no family who ever was there. All that one needs is being Jewish, a religious group like any other. The events of 1948 were a defining moment for the Middle East and from that point onward created instability throughout the region. Violent tensions continued and led to another war in 1967. In that war, Israel occupied the remainder of historic Palestine, what is known today as the West Bank and Gaza. Another myth was that Israel was about to be pushed into the sea, but I was working in the State Department at that time. There was no question of Israel being pushed into the sea. The question was just the rapidity and the totalness of the Israeli victory, and the victory was, was crushing. During the 1967 war, Israel displaced more than 400,000 Palestinians, half of whom were 1948 refugees, displaced for a second time in less than two decades. It became clear that the world was not going to address their plight. Palestinians in Israel lived as third-class citizens of a state whose core identity excluded them, while those in the newly occupied territories and abroad continued as dispossessed refugees. The United Nations passed resolution after resolution affirming their rights. Leaders of surrounding Arab nations verbally championed their cause, but failed to take action. Finally, Palestinians took matters into their own hands. There was a mass uprising, in Arabic and intifada shaking off, as people throughout the West Bank and Gaza Strip rebelled. The Israeli government adopted a strategy, in the words of Defense Minister Itzhak Rabin, of might, power, and beatings, which became known as the Break the Bones strategy.
Thousands of Palestinians were rounded up and imprisoned. Since 1967, over 400,000. Many were held without any charges whatsoever, under harsh conditions where physical abuse and torture were rampant. Today, we bear witness to an extraordinary act in one of history's defining dramas. The Oslo process begins officially with the handshake on the White House lawn. I think the main misconception of the years of Oslo were years of peace. And in that period, when there was supposed to be a peace process underway, in fact, the daily lives of Palestinians throughout the occupied territories got worse and worse and worse. The reality, and I saw it with my own eyes, that this was a new form of Israeli domination over Palestinians. Economic and social rights, which are rights to health, education, work, etc. These areas are the areas that declined the worst for the majority of Palestinians, almost all Palestinians. All the economic indicators turned for the worse under Oslo during this peace process. Moreover, Israeli settlements have continued to expand throughout that period. At the same time that Israeli control was expanding, the Palestinian Authority was given the trappings of power over the shrinking and non-contiguous Palestinian land being held out as a future Palestinian state. The challenges of governing for the Palestine Authority are extraordinarily complex. This is an authority that has very little authority. It has virtually no power. Its power is derivative. It has the power that is given to it by Israel, and at any moment, any of those powers can be taken away. It was very convenient to believe that there is no occupation, that the occupation is over. How many aspects in your life somebody else determines for you? This is occupation. And Israel could determine in the last 10 years, could determine everything. But everybody heard Arafat saying 10 times to 100 times that Ramallah is liberated and Gaza is liberated. How can it be liberated if there is an army around it? The Palestinian officials spoke very warmly about the situation, about the reality, and they were hiding the fact that for the great majority of the population, these years were a disaster. Those abuses, those violations of the public trust have been happening regularly since the Oslo process began. Palestinians who would protest against Oslo were labeled as, as, as terrorists. The authority would not allow it, the PA. Instead of having a, a real national authority, you had this corrupt institution whose main task, as far as Israel is concerned, was to police the Palestinians and prevent them from resisting the continuing occupation. It uh, has wasted a lot of the money the international community has given it, that one sees the villas of the leading Palestinian officials and the poverty with which the Palestinian masses are living in. The performance of the PLO in running the Palestinian Authority and its failures in negotiating with Israel have very much diminished support for the PLO leadership. While Americans were being told by the media that a peace process was moving forward, Israel continued its policy of home demolitions. Since 1967, about 12,000 Palestinian homes have been demolished. More than 700 of those homes were demolished during the Oslo peace process. 
What you've got to have, uh, and I think it's a fair demand on the part of Palestinians that during the process of negotiation, you're not uh, turning over more and more territory to Israeli settlers uh, and changing the character of the land that you're supposed to be negotiating about. The notion that this is going to be a negotiable question does not ring true to any Palestinian who lives up against one of these settlements, which are continually expanding. And what does it mean to expand? It means you steal more land. Abdul Jawad is a Palestinian farmer whose family has lived there and tended the land for centuries. The Israeli authorities have confiscated countless acres of their farmland. شوف الأتجار كيف بيطلعوا من من تحت الحجار شايف كيف بيطلع الأتجار من تحت الحجار مش حرام هذا يبقى بدل ما يقعد بني آدم اللي بقول اللي بقول الله مش حرام هذا يقعد بداله حجر زي هذا هذه هذه معيشتنا لا إنا لا برا ولا بحرا ولا جو هذه المعيشة تعب وبنستنى لطف الله شو نعمل؟ These settlers live and prosper at the expense of the Palestinians and the Palestinians' well-being, present well-being and future well-being. And they don't see this horrible, disproportionate allocation of resources where Jewish settlers get water and electricity and gas, garbage pickup, all kinds of things that their Palestinian neighbors don't get because of the military occupation. هذيك المنطقة منطقة بين نعيم ممنوعة تجي علينا هذول الدور شوف يعني في واحد شوف يعني بي بي واحد بحوث في قلب الدور من العرب ولا واحد بحوث من العرب موجود هناك هذه السيارة يعني لو ماها إسرائيلية بعدوهاش They lost the, the middle of the valley for a bypass road, which is now an Israeli-only bypass road. They can't drive on it to go to their homes. The thing is extremely ugly to watch. I mean, this is just day-to-day -day life. I'm not talking about the fighting here. I mean, you walk through Hebron, an Arab city, you know, 100,000 Arabs, a couple hundred Jews, a settlers walking around with rifles, you know, looking as if they own the place. Settlers can go in, in a Palestinian village and burn the fields there, destroy the house, hit Palestinian, even shoot Palestinian. Several of the women have been beaten by settlers on different occasions. In each of those cases, we were just being a nonviolent presence on the street, observing when settlers were acting out. And they just attacked different ones of us. <laughs> The Israeli government is not doing anything to try and stop the settlers from violating Palestinian rights. From all the cases that settlers actually killed Palestinians, very few were accused of murder, but then the president came and gave amnesty or shortened the punishment that they received from the court. In, in some cases, they cooperate with them, they, they guard them. Like one case, the settlers went and um, took a house, a Palestinian house, and just said, well, now it's ours. So the border police stood down there to, to protect them because the Palestinians were angry. So the border police just stood there and protected the settlers uh, instead of, of course, arresting them, just saying it's illegal. The bottom line is to make things so difficult for the Palestinians that anybody that wants a future for their children, anybody that wants to get ahead in life, anybody that wants a normal life will leave. I mean, I'm going to say that I have a house like this, and I'm going to 
ويعني بده بده يرحل وبده يروح ويرحل ويدشرها وين بدنا نروح احنا وندشر ارضنا اللي زي هيك The Jabber family continues to live under constant harassment. Most recently, Abdul Jawad broke his leg while trying to protect his grandchildren from settler attacks. Many of us feel hostage, that we're held hostage to the settlers. Because I think the vast majority of Israelis don't, don't care about the, the occupied territories. But we're held hostage to the settlers that have enough political power within the Israeli political system that they can frustrate any attempt to get them out. And as long as they're there, the Palestinians can't possibly make peace. There are two kinds of settlers, basically. There are the ideological settlers who, uh, who feel that uh, these territories are, uh, have been promised to the Jewish people by God. And they feel that every place which is mentioned in the Bible, they have the, not only the right, but the sacred duty to come and to, to build their, a modern Jewish settlement. And if Palestinians who live on that spot uh, have other ideas, then they have the right to, to break the resistance by force or to call in the army. And the other kind, which are the more um, a majority of the settlers are in fact ordinary Israelis who came there simply because the government was offering them very cheap housing. When you go to live there, then most of the money you get is a government loan, and if you stay there for 10 years, then you don't have to pay back the loan. <laughs> I think the unpleasant and unavoidable comparison is with South Africa during the apartheid period. And I must say that having visited South Africa, that they were uh, much better off than the Palestinians living in the refugee camps. to jail because it was impossible to sit still while the obscenity of the apartheid system was being imposed on our people. The United States is seen quite correctly as being the sole supporter of Israel and that Israel would not be able to do what it's doing without American green light. The U.S.-Israeli relationship is really unique on Capitol Hill. In my 22 years that I served there, there was never a moment when there was really a debate about U.S. policy in the Middle East. It was always, what does Israel want, and almost always, Congress gave them exactly what they wanted without any debate, without any amendments being considered. This type of policy exists for, as a result of a number of factors. First of all, there is the lobby, the U.S. lobby for Israel, APAC, American Israeli uh, Public Affairs Committee. It has a, 
multi-million dollar budget. It has a highly professional group of people working on Capitol Hill. They know the legislative process, they know the personalities, and uh, therefore advance what's best for the state of Israel. Congress seems to think that if you oppose what Israel wants, you'll be defeated in the next election. Another factor is the fundamentalist Christian community. Fundamentalists are often represented by the televangelists that are on TV. They believe that uh, a strong Israel is a part of God's plan. They believe that uh, the day will come when a battle will occur in the plain of Armageddon in the Middle East. There will be the forces of truth and righteousness on one side, the force of evil on the other side. And in that struggle, the Christian forces led by the second coming of Jesus Christ will prevail. All of the Jews will be either destroyed or converted instantly to Christianity. It may sound to the, to the viewer as a very uh, far out notion, but believe me, it is widely held and supported by millions of Americans whose doctrines really in the ultimate are hostile to the survival of Jews, but nevertheless, the supporters of Israel see this vast body of American people as being a great asset at this time, so they embrace them. And Mr. Robertson who said, I had a vision from God that we have to support Israel. And no matter what happens and what they do, this is the will of God because they're God's chosen people. A couple of weeks later, he added, and that's when this ministry started really being blessed, when we made that commitment to Israel. Not the commitment to God or Jesus Christ's teachings, but to Israel. And we have come from all the nations of the earth to say to the people of Israel, we are your friends, we are with you, and we believe that you are called by God to possess this land. I, as a Christian and a Christian pastor, object not in my name and not in the name of over 115 to 120 million Christians do you dare say that we support injustice and deceit. We do not. The citizenry of this democratic society is systematically deprived of access to the real facts. The American media play a major role in continuing U.S. support for Israel through leaving out vast swaths of information. It is the classic case of lying through omission. Major statements by American diplomats, senators, military leaders are going unreported. Sentences are being removed from news stories. Information is being manipulated. Those are the three factors that work together on Capitol Hill and lead to such total bias, such total absence of free speech, of open debate, that is, I think, very destructive to our institutions and to our best interests in world affairs. So Israel, for example, does not abide at all by international law. The entire occupation is illegal. It's a violation in particular of the Fourth Geneva Convention. By the rules of the Fort Geneva Convention, you're not allowed to build settlements, you're not allowed to build roads, you're not allowed to expropriate land, you're not allowed to deport people, you're not allowed to, to restrict their freedom of movement, you're not allowed to uh, harm their economy, you're not allowed to make them unemployed and impoverished. But everything that Israel does in the occupied territories, U.S. taxpayers are paying for. The U.S. gives the financing, it gives the military support. Israel. Uh, receives as much foreign economic assistance as all the countries combined in the world. Combined in the world.
In March 2003, the U.S. government approved $10 billion in aid for Israel. At the same time, it withheld a $3.5 billion grant to upgrade the training of first responders, those who would be first to respond to a terrorist attack. Spent domestically, that $10 billion could buy health care coverage for over 4 million children without proper coverage, or pay for 1.5 million American children to attend Head Start child development programs to prepare them for school or simply help states offset the costs of one of the worst fiscal crises in half a century. One of the reasons that the American commitment to Israel is so strong that it's not only reflecting the impact of well-organized pro-Israeli lobbies, but it also represents the views of the Pentagon that sees Israel now as an indispensable strategic ally in the effort to control and exert influence throughout the region. The main concern for the United States, like the world, is the, the oil producing regions. And in order to control that, you need a way of doing it. Desperate for a peace that would finally end occupation, Palestinians again came to the negotiating table in 2000. People think, look, Israel was very forthcoming. It offered 95% of the West Bank, of the occupied territories to the Palestinians, and they rejected it in violence. The assumption of that 95% argument is that getting 95% of the land gives you 95% sovereignty, a sovereign country. But I think it's very useful to think in terms of a prison. If you look at a blueprint of a prison, it looks like the prisoners own the place. And the prisoners have 95% of the area. They've got the, the living areas, they have the exercise yard, they have the uh, cafeteria, they've got the work areas. All the prison authorities have is 5%, is the control. The average Palestinian didn't think they were throwing anything away because there was nothing to throw away. They had tuned out what Barack and Arafat were talking about because on the ground, there were ongoing land expropriations, tree uprootings, road building, unfair water allocation, leaving many Palestinian families in the summer and fall with two hours of running water a week, when next door you have a settlement with a swimming pool and green lawns. So what do you expect people to think? And it was that pressure, that sense of being squeezed, uh, that finally exploded in September of 2000 in what became the second Intifada. The Second Intifada is essentially a mobilization of resistance against this structure of occupation and oppression. Israel, from the very beginning of these demonstrations, had indeed relied on excessive force. They had used live ammunition against unarmed demonstrators, had inflicted several deaths, and hundreds of casualties in the opening days of the Intifada. Sometimes the Israelis are, are speaking about rubber bullets, 
they used. By the way, it's not rubber. It's steel coated with rubber. This bullet, it killed many of, uh, of the kids uh, who are demonstrating, I mean, sometimes um, while they are throwing stones. As this case, I'll show you what happened. He is a 14 years old from Khan Yunus. He was shot with the one like this and it entered here and he died. A lot of the, the deaths have been children and we do have some documentary evidence that security forces are firing on crowds of children. The soldiers weren't at risk. They're heavily armored, they have all this high-powered weaponry, and no child with a stone is gonna be a, a risk to them. And most of the Palestinian abuses involve um, shooting at settlements, um, ambushes on settler cars, and obviously the suicide bombings inside Israel. There are some risks to Israeli life. Many Israelis have been killed. When there was this horrible suicide bombing at, at the pizza place in Jerusalem, I went to visit some of the kids who survived that blast in the hospital. It was horrible. It was horrible to see what happened to these children. You see the blood, you see the agony of the family. This is what the world sees. But one cannot take it out of the general context. And the context is of an Israeli occupation, which is, it seems not to be so brutal, but it's very brutal. It really makes people's lives unbearable. The use of suicide bombers is an act of desperation. It's the weapons of the weak. Israel doesn't do, uh, do it, never, because it has uh, airplanes and helicopters. Why should they send anybody to make suicide? I think we have to change our, our conception of what Israel is. Israel likes to present itself as this little country surrounded by a sea of hostile Arabs, and we just want peace, and they're violent. Israel is the fifth largest nuclear power in the world. It's got between two and three hundred nuclear warheads. So the reality is that Israel is a regional superpower. For the first time, the resistance to that occupation had, to a very small extent, an armed component. There was nothing close to equal force. At every stage, they had used grossly excessive force against a completely defenseless a civilian population. The victims have been overwhelmingly Palestinian civilians, um, overwhelmingly, um, not armed groups or armed individuals. Israel has established all of these checkpoints within the West Bank, which require Palestinians to wait hours and hours to go very short distances. Just the freedom of movement, it's something that Palestinians are denied on a daily basis. The access to Jerusalem, the access to health care, the access to hospitals, clinics, and schools. We're talking about three million people who's had the freedom of movement totally stopped. It's a violation of international law that the right to freedom of movement is a fundamental right in the Declaration of Human Rights. What you have is young Israeli conscripts who look bored. These guys are sitting out there and they're watching thousands of Palestinians go by. They have carte blanche to pull anyone over and harass them for whatever reason. They can detain them for hours and it's a dangerous situation. The main population that are being uh, affected by Israeli policies is the civilian population. Those population who, who is not being involved in any attacks against Israelis, civilians or the army. During this time of closure, unfortunately, there have been lots of bombings, lots of attacks. The closure is not meant to deter suicide bombers. 
It's meant to punish and put pressure on three million civilians. People do not earn any more because the majority of the Palestinians used to work in Israel and the majority of the Palestinian economy was based on the income of people who were working inside Israel. Now they cannot go into Israel, so tens of thousands of families just lose the source of income that they had. The education system is also affected by that. The student cannot go to the university. Birzeit University was subject to army closures for something like 18 times. The longest closure was during the first intifada. For five years we could not set foot on campus. During this period we organized what the Israeli army called cells of illegal education. We were teaching in apartments, in rented flats, in churches, in mosques, in gardens, in cars, and we kept our infrastructure. Even this attempt to minimize the damage and to keep the university going, they attempted to crush it. I went to a college in the States and I found it very differently. Your biggest like worry about in the States is if I'm going to pass my class or oh, I hope I have a lot of friends over here. It's totally different. You have to worry, oh my god, would I be able to get to school? Is there going to be a checkpoint? Is there going to be a demonstration? Am I going to get shot at? Are there, is there going to be tear gas? So it's like completely different. Here it's just like you don't know if you're going to live or you're going to die, you know? You're going to school as if you're going to fight a war. You don't find a tank in the middle of the road on your way to college. And just the other day, there were two tanks and an army jeep, and they're standing there checking your passport and you know your your student visa and all this stuff. And it's just like we want to get to school. We want an education. We're we're humans, and we have a right to our education. And in places like the United States, people cannot understand what's going on because simply the experience is beyond their frame of reference. I can't study at night because my bedroom light is going to be open and it's across the street from the settlement. They shot at me. I was reading my um, biology book. I was studying for my mentor. And my mom and dad are like, no, get out of the room. But because um, they're, they're, they started shooting. I was like, no, mom, I want to get an A in the class. Let me study. So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden you hear something on my, on my bedroom window. And I was just like, okay, maybe I should go downstairs. I couldn't study for my test. It's like, I tell my American friends, I was like, do you understand what I'm going through? The amazing thing is not that you have cases of uh, suicidal students. The amazing thing is the bulk of them, they try to carry on in the middle of this mess as if life is normal, as if they want to celebrate their graduation and they want to build their life and they want to carry on. That's the other part of the coin. The root problem here is occupation. Everything else emanates from there. The most severe problem is people who need medical care. We've documented numerous cases, cases where people have died. In fact, I believe that one of the last cases we documented was a woman who was in labor, who was not allowed to get to the hospital, and she and the baby both died. If people like that, if people who are really sick and really need to go to, to hospitals cannot do that, so I think you can imagine what happened to regular people uh, that just want to go to work, just want to go to do some shopping, or even just visit friends. It's like living in a prison, uh, a gigantic prison. Ka'aretz, the intellectual newspaper in Israel, ran a whole, like a four-page magazine article on the refugee issue. It had a picture of Tel Aviv University now and what was there before Tel Aviv University? A Palestinian village. And those refugees are in Gaza. <laughs> I think that Gaza is a main problem. There are lots of violations that you will not see in the West Bank, you will see in Gaza. We find it hard to monitor the human rights situation in Gaza because the Israeli army do not let us in.
Palestinians in Gaza had been under Israeli military control for over 38 years, where 1.3 million Palestinians were crowded together to make room for 8,000 Israeli settlers. In August of 2005, Israel dismantled its settlements and military posts inside Gaza and relocated its settlers. The media, along with Israeli politicians, portrayed this as an unprecedented sacrifice. In reality, it was simply a matter of Israel finally complying with international law. Although Israel's presence inside Gaza is no longer visible, Israel will still retain ultimate control over Gaza's borders, coastal waters, and airspace, creating a virtual prison. Refugee camps, even if there was no conflict with Israel, are just uh, humanly horrible. They're so overcrowded. And you have 14 to 25 people living in a space. There's no place for children to be there. No streets, there are little alleys, no trees, nothing. This this is what has been fired on this neighborhood. This is a civilian neighborhood. There are no soldiers here. There are no there are no military installations here. This is strictly harassment to get these people to move away from the border so that the Israeli tanks can 
can move at will. They want these people cleansed from this area. It's that simple. And it's a way to get people to be humiliated and destitute again. In Gaza, you can see also the extent of house demolitions, much more extensive than in the, in the West Bank. The whole neighborhoods have been demolished. Hundreds of people do not have any houses anymore because they are next to settlements or next to the border, which is, of course, a clear violation of humanitarian law. People have no chance to get their personal items out. They have no chance to call for help. And this is far away from most media outlets. You are amongst the very few journalists who have even seen this. European or American journalists who have even been here because people are afraid to come or it's too hard to come. And one of the things we were told in Gaza by a very respected Palestinian uh, psychologist who had just completed a study of a thousand Palestinian children was that they had discovered that many of these Palestinian children no longer had a will to live, that they were so dehumanized and so affected by seeing their fathers particularly beaten by Israeli uh, defense forces, that the psychological condition is one of the dimensions of the conflict that is not widely understood. Palestinians called for an international observer force that would stop the violence. But this action was blocked by Israel. Finally, a group of Palestinian and Israeli human rights activists together created the International Solidarity Movement which has brought people from around the world of all ages and backgrounds to provide a nonviolent international presence to try to fill this need. Rachel Corey, a 23-year-old American student, went to Gaza to join in these efforts, sending back emails to her parents. I have been in Palestine for two weeks and one hour now, and I still have very few words to describe what I see. It is most difficult for me to think about what's going on here when I sit down to write back to the United States. Something about the virtual portal into luxury. I don't know if many of the children here have ever existed without tank shell holes in their walls and the towers of an occupying army surveying them constantly from the near horizons. I think, although I'm not entirely sure, that even the smallest of these children understand that life is not like this everywhere. It was uh, a Sunday um, afternoon in Charlotte, about noon actually, and I received a phone call. And my uh, son-in-law, Kelly, was on the phone and um, he asked if Craig was there. And something about the way he asked made me realize, I, I felt right away that something was wrong. And, and then I asked, why, Kelly? And he hesitated for a minute and he said, we've had some very sad news. And then my daughter, Sarah, I could hear her in the background. And she got on the telephone and she said, Mom, it's Rachel. And I, I think the first words out of my mouth then were, is she dead? Opposing the demolition of farmland and other property, uh, Palestinian property by Israeli destruction forces and villagers. And the bulldozer drove up and it kept going and she tried to move back but she couldn't move back and she got caught underneath. She got caught underneath the bulldozer. Many other internationals began to surround the bulldozer and yell at it and tell us that there is somebody there and it did not stop.
where Rachel was killed, she was protecting a doctor's home. And that's important to realize that and the three children, and his wife, she knew that family and, and, and that doctor felt that Rachel was like a, a daughter to him. He bought that house, it was in the middle of the neighborhood. There were other rows of houses between his house and the border. Those other homes, those other streets were all destroyed and now it was his turn. Uh, and I've had people say, well, she was in a war zone, and Cindy points out that war zone is people's, it is people's neighborhoods. That, those are children. I'm here for other children. I'm here because I care. I'm here because children everywhere are suffering and because 40,000 people die each day from hunger. I'm here because those people are mostly children. We have got to understand that the poor are all around us and we're ignoring them. We have got to understand that these deaths are preventable. We have got to understand that people in third world countries think and care and smile and cry just like us. We have got to understand that they are us. We are them. My dream is to stop hunger by the year 2000. My dream is to give the poor a chance. My dream is to save the 40,000 people who die each day. My dream can and will come true if we all look into the future and see the light that shines there. As Israel completed its withdrawal from Gaza, the following day it issued orders to confiscate additional Palestinian land from the West Bank and continue the construction of a separation wall. This wall is twice the height of the Berlin Wall and four times longer. It rips through villages, severing travel for work, health care, and education, separating farmers from their lands and families from loved ones. An Israeli study revealed that the barrier's route was chosen in order to confiscate land intended for illegal settlement expansion not for security reasons. Here you have this huge wall being constructed right in the middle of the, of the West Bank. How can anybody believe that there's going to be the creation of a real state? It's a symbol and a reality of oppression. Anybody outside of Israel who supports a two-state solution has to be very careful because what they mean in a two-state solution is that 90% of historical Palestine would be Israel. In the rest 10% you'll have two huge prison camps, one in the Gaza Strip and one in the West Bank. The people who uh, fought in the war were also the people who wrote the history books of the war. And they already had the story that they uh, made up about what had really happened. And that story was integrated in the Israeli educational system. It was integrated in the media and the political discourse. Some of us who work as Jewish educators have been admitting over the last maybe 10 years that it is propaganda. Israelis don't understand what's going on. They don't know the occupation. We began to educate ourselves. And the first thing we did was invite women, Palestinian women, to come into our homes and talk to us and tell us what exactly was the problem as they saw it. And little by little, we learned about their lives. We learned about the suffering they encountered on a daily basis. We learned about the killing going on there, about the lives that were completely circumscribed by an occupation that they had no control over. I'm one of the few Israelis not in uniform and not a settler that's been in the territories in the last nine months. You see that, that the army was actually waging a very cruel war. On the Israeli side, there seems to be no understanding that this is how you create terrorism. If you are so repressive on a people, you give them uh, the sense of having no options, and that's a very dangerous place. In fact, there's a very clear correlation between the kind of human rights abuses that Israel commits in the West Bank and Gaza and the Palestinian militant response to those abuses. No. 
most Israelis have very clear views. This is a very political country. And when you talk to somebody, you can argue all night and you can go red in the face or blue in the face or whatever the color, you won't get anywhere. But when somebody says, I refuse to do this, this is wrong for me, for us, for our country. This is immoral and I'll go to prison rather than do it. And one guy does it, five guys, and 50 and 100. And people say, hey, what's going on here? These aren't cowards, these aren't traitors. Most of them are officers, by the way. So if these guys are refusing, there must be something wrong here. Uh, nobody can argue with what I've seen. I mean, they may not like how I say it, or they may not like all the facts that I convey. It may sound like I'm imbalanced, but the fact is, when you're dealing with oppression, there is no balance. Even someone with a 20% open mind would reach the same conclusions that our commission reached. You could be pro-Israeli, and still, if you saw these realities, you'd have to have a completely closed mind not to come to the same conclusions that we reached. So the violence begins with the occupation. The opposition is resistance to the occupation. Resistance to violence is legitimate in any country in the world. I may disagree with some of the acts of resistance. I think some of the tactics are stupid. Attacks on Israeli civilians are stupid, immoral, and counterproductive. They should be stopped. You should not use violence whatsoever because it, it really destroys our intentions and it destroys our position, which is the, in the higher moral standing. We are the victims, and the world should not understand that we are the victims. Criticizing the Israeli government policy for assassinating people or for shooting children and maiming them for thousands of children that's not anti-Semitic, that's humane. We have to tell the truth about what's going on and say as clearly as we can, if you keep going down this path, you're gonna destroy yourselves. No enemy will have to destroy you. You're rotting from within because of the methods you're using against innocent people. I don't think even with the best video that you can make, Americans will really understand what it is like to be a Palestinian under occupation. I guarantee you, if you spend one week in Gaza or in the West Bank, you will understand it in a very profound way. All the wars of independence, you can start if you want with the war of independence of the United States. They say the no taxation with, without representation. And we demand taxation from the Palestinians and don't give them any representation. It is the same all over the world and nobody wants to be under somebody's occupation. South America to meet the Native American Indians. We're looking for these, like, you know, uh, uh, indigenous people with some kind of more, more rooted wisdom, you know, and they're right here. They're right here, right under our noses. Nobody ever comes here. You know, the Falahin for me, the, the Palestinian Falahin, like, it's like, you know, everything that they, yeah, that, that people go looking for, you know, people with like deep, deep roots, really connected to the earth with this, in this romance with their land, you know, and just incredibly wise and open-hearted and, and simple, beautiful, and, and, and Israelis never see them unless it's through a, you know, target. I wish that people knew what was really going on here, and I wish that people could see these people through my eyes. You know, that's what often I'm looking at people and they're so incredibly beautiful and I'm just thinking, I wish that Israelis could for one minute see them through my eyes.
No amount of reading, attendance at conferences, documentary viewing, and word of mouth could have prepared me for the reality of the situation here. You just can't imagine it unless you see it. This is not at all what I asked for when I came into this world. This is not at all what the people here asked for when they came into this world. This is not the world you and Dad wanted me to come into when you decided to have me. This has to stop. I think it is a good idea for us all to drop everything and devote our lives to making this stop. The real battle for justice in the Middle East has to be fought and won here in America. This is an American issue because this is an issue of American foreign policy. Israelis are talking about this and I think it's time for Americans to realize they're the only ones not talking about it. And it's actually very dangerous for their own interests and for the interest of Israeli Jews here. I mean, we're not going to be tossed in jail, we're not going to be tortured. You know, we're not facing what people in the occupied territories are facing. Uh, if we decide we don't want to do it, fine, but then try to look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a murderer. It's really high time for Americans to step up to the plate, to do whatever we can, encourage our government to take a strong initiative to end the occupation. Those who really care about the interests of Israel should exert all the pressure possible in order to force Israel to stop the aggression, stop the repression, end the occupation. And the just solution has to be ending the occupation. Ending the occupation is step number one. Justice is the best way of bringing about security and peace. There'll be no security for Israel as long as this kind of oppression continues. Close my eyes to If I dream, then they'll take their Oh, I'll try, oh, I'll try to find, to stay. Shame.